Hello and welcome to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast series. My name is Jonathan Brown. Shepherd Walwyn is a campaigning book publisher based in London, England. Our purpose is to uncover and promote new ideas to society's oldest problems. And whilst our specialty is ethical economics, something Anthony Werner, our driving force for over 40 years, has pioneered, we have branched out over the years to other related areas such as the environment and the lives and works of society's change agents. These podcasts promote ideas we're convinced can actually help us build a better society for all of us. So have a listen and be sure to share with your friends if you like them, but also tell us what you think. These are debates we all need to be part of. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Today's author is Dr. Eddie Billamoria. Eddie is joining us for what will become a series of conversations to celebrate and explore his extraordinary four-volume, 1,200-page magnus opus, Unfolding Consciousness exploring the living universe and intelligent powers in nature and humans. Eddie was born in India and educated at the universities of London, Sussex and Oxford, and he presents an unusual blend of experience in the fields of science, engineering, art and philosophy. He's worked as a consultant in many industries, including oil and gas, aerospace and construction, and he's been a project manager and head of design for major innovative projects such as the Channel Tunnel, London Underground Systems and other off-store installations. A student of the perennial philosophy for over four decades, he has given courses and lectures extensively around the world. He's organised and chaired several major conferences, and his written work has been published extensively in the fields of science, engineering and the esoteric philosophy. And on top of all of this, he is also an accomplished concert pianist. Unfolding Consciousness is a culmination of a life's work and has already garnered much critical acclaim. In this episode, we have part two of Eddie's discussion of Volume 1, a panoramic survey, science contrasted with the perennial philosophy on consciousness and man. So if you haven't already captured Part 1, be sure to catch that now. So Eddie, I think at this stage, we've given mm-hmm. people an overview. Whilst mm-hmm. it certainly will not cover the, the extraordinary 150, mm-hmm. 200 pages that you've got around the, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, the wonder and the challenge of, of modern science and and. We're now moving, I think, in towards your conversation and the dialogue around ancient teaching and the mystery schools. Mm-hmm. I just wonder where would be the best place for us to start that conversation? Yes, the best place to start would be with the perennial philosophy and the way it's expressed through the esoteric doctrine, occult science, the mystery teachings, and all the various terms that uh, are embraced by the umbrella term the, the perennial philosophy. Now, the, the mystery teachings are not a panacea for the ills of the world in any age. But such is the stature of these great teachings that they contain the overarching problems of any epoch. But it doesn't mean that these teachings disseminated through the legendary sages and philosophers It doesn't mean that these teachings had foreseen the detailed problems and analyzed the complexity of every situation. That would be absolutely ridiculous. But rather that the teachings have evolved a method whereby the mind was so trained in the fundamental verities of life that it was able to cope intelligently with any emergency that might arise. So, for example, an expert motorist can't be expected to anticipate every roadblock, every pothole, every traffic light on his route. But being an expert motorist, as a result of his expertise, he can negotiate all these obstacles on his journey. So the teachings of the mysteries, uh, the mystery teachings are based on eternal verities, not belief on the divine order of existence, because it was suggested, it was shown that problems individual and societal stem from man's character and disposition, and only secondarily from economic and material factors. So sorry, sorry, so hang on a second, Eddie. So yeah. can you, what, 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 what does verity mean? What, what's verity? I mean, truth. It's a truth. Okay. Right. Yeah, okay yeah. Right. I knew um, a girl called Verity, so that's a that's a oh truth. well, that's a lovely <laughs> name for a girl. Yeah. So, so it means like, truth. So what you what you're talking about then is it's it's I mean, at, at the risk of reducing it down to um, further than it ought to be. 
what you're saying is the mystery teachings are not providing answers mm. they're providing problem solving or solution finding yes technologies or ideas or approaches so that you can you can navigate the challenges of life and yeah. and and i guess beyond right of yeah. handling your own mortality right. is that is that right yes it's not providing a, a, a gps sat nav a turn left here and go right there but it's providing you with the driving skills so that you can um drive your your vehicle and what we're what we're going to get into are the verities mm -hmm. or the truths in mm -hmm. the mystery teachings mm -hmm. that we can use as as principles or guideposts mm -hmm. um in order to 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 create a better existence mm -hmm. for That's ourselves right. brilliant sorry have i just um have i just taken your um your thunder there no so we're moving into the mystery schools and we're also, is this, a, is this a time to talk about what occultism and occult science is? Because um, you get into that and I know some people that I've spoken to about it have got a somewhat cynical or concerned mm, view around mm, what mm. occult actually means. Mm. Right, the word occult does indeed generate no end of scoffing if i can put it that way it is so often dismissed as profane and dark so what does it really mean well the etymology of the word archive simply means conceal that which is hidden so occult science deals with the hidden and unseen realms of nature that are the causative influences behind the outward phenomena we see. And you talk about uh, the mystery teachings of the savior of humanity. I just mm, wonder what's so mysterious about the mystery schools? Right, um, <laughs> the mystery only in the sense that it's a mystery until you probe it. Um, the, what's so mysterious about it is the revelation of teachings of high uh, standing to worthy candidates who have the responsibility and the the character to handle these teachings hmm. without harming themselves and the world at large but let's just get back to um, occult which is a word actually used in medical science occult blood is the word they use for you know, hidden, well, traces of blood. Uh, you know, all these associations with black magic and witchcraft notwithstanding, the word, as I said, means secret or hidden and derives from the past participle of um, oculere, or to cover up. So I'll call science, let's be clear, is the science of the hidden laws of nature that lie at the root of all life and pertain to the unseen and the higher realms of existence they therefore constitute the ground of physical existence so our science refers to the hermetic or esoteric sciences esoteric mean with a key which explore the essential or hidden secrets physical and psychic mental and spiritual but do not exclude the physical of course so occult science deals with the true nature of things not just the physical appearance and it is an absolutely sacred science occult science because it stands for the real and transcendent knowledge of the highest truths and therefore it demands the practice of altruism and pure spirituality and it is the misuse the misuse of occult science by the selfish and unethical that leads to the traditional charge of the black arts so it's very important to distinguish the practice from the practitioner for example, should we hold nuclear physics responsible for the horrors of Hiroshima? 
do we denounce biochemistry because of the unfortunate thalidomide disaster? If we choose to jump from a skyscraper to kill ourselves, do we berate the force of gravity? And finally, let's realize that any force in nature is completely impersonal, powerful, but impersonal. Take human sexuality. There's no end of filth and disaster going on. Does that mean that human sexuality per se is an evil force? No, it's how you use it. But with occult science, because the truth or what is revealed is so powerful and so dangerous in the wrong hands, the propensity for misuse is thereby much greater. And therefore, the mystery schools and their teachers have gone to great lengths to ensure the purity and disposition of the student before revealing these deeper truths. Hmm. And one of the ways of protecting occult science from those who would misuse it is to use blinds, what's known as blinds, which appear to be gibberish for those who have not understood the key, but are highly meaningful to those who have understood. So it's a way of wrapping what is explosive and powerful in such terms that it, it appears meaningless until you understand what's behind that wrapping. Mm. I don't know, and, and I'm just thinking, <clears throat> I had a thought in my mind just then, just about um, the, you know, <laughs> Indiana Jones and the movies there and the difference between the, the, that, that, the movie where the Nazis are, are, are chasing after a, an incredibly powerful artifact. Um, mm. And it's only the, it's only those with the, you know, the spiritual side of the, of the Indiana mm. Jones movies, mm. which expresses what you've just said of, mm. of the importance of the purity of the, of the seeker mm. and that they then, and if, and if, if you if you do not approach these things with a level of purity or positive mm. intention mm. or you know for the to help yourself and others and mm. i think the helping others is being the key part of it yes. and it will create a great deal of damage but and yes. and, and the, the teachings there and it'll create most damage for you mm. um and it will corrupt uh, will you know it, it'll, it'll it'll come back onto you mm. this really underscores the difference between psychic powers and spiritual powers so very um in very broad terms, psychic powers are the, the lowest powers of the intermediary nature, the soul nature mm. in the human being, and invariably used, alas, for selfish purposes and self-seeking aims to gain power over others. To gain power and control over others is, a, unfortunately, um, a, a tremendous human weakness. Spiritual powers by contrast are the efflorescence of the highest nature in man and always used completely impersonally and laid down on the altar of self-service and altruistic behavior. So efflorescence, what's, what's that? Eff efflorescence, flowering. Okay, right. So it's a, sorry, could you just repeat what you just said there? Because I didn't, I didn't quite follow the... Yes, I said the, the, the psychic powers generally are the powers to do with the lower nature yeah known as the cities and the cities is the sanskrit term the lower cities and the higher cities the higher cities are the spiritual powers which are never used for personal gain but the higher spiritual powers are the flowering of the higher nature in man and always laid down on the altar of philanthropy and service right and, and so, so if I was trying to cultivate psychic power, then it's really about, about how to have more power on this, um, on earth. But, but the spiritual is actually my connection with the greater. Um, Not only on earth, uh, controlling other people's minds and, yeah. and, and other. Yes, but yes, in essence, yes, that is, wow. uh, yeah. Okay. And never to be tampered with and forced. There are all sorts of so-called courses on how to develop your psychic powers and i would strongly warn against all of that 
So there's only one way. And what's that? The tried and tested way of self mastery. Bring always raising the lower nature to its highest possible potentiality by lifting the lower nature towards the higher nature. Then all these powers will come of their own accord. And then one develops faculties in in the natural way, rather than trying to force them through drugs or rituals or abnormal breathing practices. And is that the essence of of um, of the study of the mystery schools? Then, yes, how the, to raise yourself, how to raise, how to raise exactly your being so. up. Exactly, to merge the lower self into the higher nature is the essence of all the teachings. And all the trials and tribulations are for that central purpose, yes. And so, and so can you explain the difference then between spirit and spiritual? And also the other thing is, as I was interested as well, is, is what are they in relation to modern day science? Right, spirit is a very impoverished term, unfortunately, in English. <laughs> English is a wonderful language for explaining things on the objective level, but for subjective uh, explanations, uh, it's a very um, impoverished language, and Sanskrit would be so much better. Uh, spirit from spiritus, we can still see, relates to the idea of, of a breathing. So it is the in-breath of the divine. So you can say spirit is the ultimate essence in every being. And spiritual really is to be conscious of that and to relate and behave according to that. Atma, the divine self, uh, comes from Atman to inspire. It's to do with the breath again. Mm. And we have that in the in the word to inspire, which is also is to breathe inspire, in. Inspire, yes. And that's, that's what you're taking is you're taking in the spiritus. And I aspire, of course. Right. To reach out. To aspire and inspire. Mm. Wow. Um, now, something that's um, that's part of the mystery school and the mystery teachings mm. is a, a lady called Helena. Um, oh, yeah. Of <laughs> yeah. Um, and that gets us into the, the field of theosophy which as i understand it well actually it codified i brought together the ancient teachings in the 19th yes. century is that right absolutely um sorry say that again it oh so codified. so for example so who was who was helena blavatsky mm -hmm. and and what then what was her work in in the area of theosophy um yeah, yeah and that let's start with that yes sure well Helena Blavatsky was born in, would you believe, what's known as Dniepro in, in the Ukraine, <laughs> the subject of a lot of a place of a lot of turmoil now. And her unique contribution was to reveal the common origin of the accumulated wisdom of all ages by virtue of a synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy through the unifying medium of the esoteric science, occult sciences, where in this way she demonstrated forcefully that nature, like man, is not just a fortuitous concurrence put together by chance of material atoms, but a living organic being. So in, the, in my consideration, Blavatsky's work is completely unequaled in terms of making these facts known in the wider public domain. And she wrote like a true scientist, which means everything she quoted from, she provided chapter and verse, page number, volume and references. So in her tremendous work, one of them, The Secret Doctrine Alone, there are well over 10,000 references, which we can verify for ourselves. So like a real PhD student, you, you state your case, you state where you got it from, and then you develop the theme. So her great contribution was to bring together, as she herself said, gentlemen, I've only provided a nosegay, a nosegay around 
these priceless flowers of the ancient wisdom but the nosegay that the wrapper which i call the thread doctrine is what unifies them and points to their one single source so the the sheer depth and sophistication of occultism and her teachings is quite prodigious what's theosophy's relationship to the perennial philosophy oh every relationship uh, perennial philosophy again is this rather <coughs> umbrella term the the various teachings the mystery teachings um are under the name of uh, theosophy which are defined newton referred to the sacra sapientia the sacred teachings fritz of schuon the swiss uh, um, philosopher referred to it as the religio um, philosophia leibniz the philosophia perennis all providing different nuances on a teaching that is sacred religious in the true sense and of the deepest nature now theosophy itself really means nothing more than theosophia the wisdom not wisdom of god not at all the wisdom as possessed by the gods gods in the plural gods meaning the intelligent forces and powers in nature and it is certainly not a term that she invented it goes right back to jacob bohm it goes right back to Ammonius Saccas of the Alexandrian school, who wanted a system based, again, as I put it earlier, on eternal verities, on eternal truths. So it's important, of course, to distinguish theosophy from the Theosophical Society, of course, and its modern expression. But don't ever think that theosophy comes just from the modern Theosophical Society. It doesn't, it goes right back. But the modern Theosophical Society has provided the great service of bringing together what has been scattered over centuries and epochs and prehistoric ages into a comprehensive body that we can understand in the age we live in now. Mm. And you, you talk as well about how mysticism is truer to the scientific ethos yes. than even science. Yeah. Um, how, how is that the case? Yes, because mysticism leaves nothing out of its purview, out of its investigations. It's something that the um, professor Rene Weber of Rutgers University uh, emphasized in her book, uh, Conversations with Remarkable Men. If the scientist leaves himself out of the picture, he only understands part of the picture. I think it was Max Planck, the great founder of quantum physics, who said that science could never understand the ultimate mystery of nature because we are part of that mystery ourselves. So mysticism truly involves and evokes or invokes the whole picture, including the investigator. Mm. So in that sense, it, it really provides the theory of everything. Well, and I, I mentioned yeah. John Wheeler, uh, the quantum physicist, who realized that participation is the, the way that we should move forward, not standing behind a thick glass wall and just looking on as a detached observer. So the mystic who can participate and be one with his uh, investigation or his, his the object of his research uh, includes more than the detached scientist mm. well, you know, many it, scientists are mystics many scientists are mystics well and I, I think what you also look at as well is it is it, it is possible to to gain insight from a, a pretense that mm. my my presence does not change what i'm looking at and I guess in certain conditions that could be the case, but the, the, what you're saying, the deeper level and the deeper the integrated view is to include everything in, in your calculations. Yes. And that includes yourself. 
Yeah. And I guess as well, looking at the, you know, the insights around, you know, waves and particles in, um, in quantum science of way in which that the way in which you look at something mm. changes what you're looking at and changes what you get back. Yes, that is so. And that, in a sense, is, is a very good formulation of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, mm. that to observe conjugate variables like mass and momentum that are variables that are linked, and the observation of one will mean a change or displacement in the other. So an accurate measurement of one precludes an accurate measurement of the other at the same time. Yeah. And I mean, in, in my area around, around organizations and, and dynamic environments mm. is that there's no understanding a dynamic environment without being in it. Um, yes, and, yes. And, and of that, then you have to you have to feel it. And there's, I don't know if you know that if you follow the, you know, the, the boxing arts of, of Manny Pacquiao um, is he had a he had a new coach. Um, mm. And and the thing that, that what one, one of these one of his coaches um mm-hmm. he actually got in the ring with him and and so when he was looking at Manny Pacquiao who was one of the fastest and also it turned out one of the most powerful boxers of his generation mm-hmm. um is that he could feel um Manny's punches he could see them so as a scientist if you're outside the ring you could see how fast he was mm-hmm. but what he um, could feel it he could yeah. feel the power mm-hmm. and so in that sense and that allowed him to help him in a way that that other other coaches couldn't because he could actually interact with him in a way that, that enhanced his own dynamism and his own power. And, um, and as I say, in, in organizations, is that I, I, I take a lot of time to understand that my impact on a situation. So the idea that, that as some, I'm, you know, I'm here from head office to help kind of thing, mm-hmm. um, the idea that I can go and look at people working and not interfere with their working, mm-hmm. even if I'm not saying anything, that my presence is going to distract them to some extent, or even... Mm-hmm even cause alarm or, or fear mm. Mm. is that I have to work very hard in order to be invisible to them mm-hmm. in that I don't change their interactions. Mm. Um, and it's extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible to an extent, really. But um, Yes, what you said about <coughs> feeling the, the presence it, it relates really to the higher levels of martial arts, doesn't it? Mm. Where you can yes. feel your so-called opponent's energies. Yeah. What questions would you see uh, have we got that still um, that we're still missing? One of the things again constantly to emphasize is um, human beings come first. So my central purpose to restore the human being in humanity. And it was Krishnamurti who pointed out that we are first and foremost human beings, not labels and concepts. And when you first meet someone, they say, well, tell me about yourself. And I'm a physicist. I'm a doctor. No, you're not. You're first and foremost a human being. The rest comes afterwards. So the greatest of leaders of humanity, religious, scientific, philosophical, have emphasized this human aspect. And I was at um, Rupert Sheldrake's 80th birthday celebration. And um, in his uh, wonderful address, Lord Richard Schatz, the former Bishop of London, pointed out that in the Garden of Eden, there are two trees, of course, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. Now, the tree of knowledge, of course, has given us great insights, tremendous science, but also tremendous bloodshed. The tree of life is the tree of wisdom, really. It's to do with the wisdom aspect. So the tree of life, the wisdom aspect, emphasizes our humanity. And for that reason, I would really like to draw attention to my dedication on, you know, page five of the of volume one, that not one of the great teachers allowed the transcendent answer to the worldly malaise, material and psychological. Not one of the teachers allowed that transcendent answer to be soiled by the lure 
of inventing techniques and systems to establish an earthly utopia or wasted his life energy inventing systems for dealing with the muddlement and evil of the world's politics, economics, and unregenerate everyday life at their own level. Because each one of them saw the eagle-eyed insight that man himself the world over is the cause of the problems he generates. And the only way to redeem the world is the way of purity and truth through the redemption of man's character. And of course, for speaking the truth, with few exceptions, these great masters and teachers were tortured and mangled by the masses. So look at the world of politics now. Just look at it. Look at the current Tory leadership circus, and it's a circus. Do you, do you hear anything about reforming man's character through art, music, enlightened science it's all about money 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 trade and commerce now let's be quite clear none of the great teachers ever practiced a material poverty we spoke about inner riches and outer riches they celebrated material poverty but they taught that man's character determines his dealings ethical or unethical in trade and finance so what do we see now? Holding the world to ransom over the cost of food and oil is not the fault of agriculture and oil. It is all to do with the character of those who choose to weaponize agriculture and commodities. So there is no indication that you torture your body and you live like an ascetic in order to be spiritual, far from it. But you start from man's character, from being a human being. I think that is so important to emphasize. But you know, Eddie, I, I, do, I, don't, I don't know that it was, if you look in history, is whilst it may have been the tool for the destruction of these spiritual teachers was mm. the masses, mm. that the weaponization of those people were done by a group of individuals or the elite mm. who, who, were, sure. who were scared by the teachings exactly. of, a, of a Christ or a Mahatma yeah. and, um, and masters through the ages. Yeah. And so it isn't, I don't know that there is a problem with, with the character problem of normal human beings, but there's very no. definitely a character problem with those who are in control. Exactly, um, sir. No, no, I shouldn't say normal human beings. Normal human beings are far from normal in that sense. The ordinary human being is very much the spiritual human being. It is the mass, uh, the, uh, the few people who wish to maintain an establishment quo and are very fearful of change. Well, um, and, and if you look at the essence of the wisdom through the ages is, mm -hmm. is actually the distribution, every insight that's come from, from a, a sage or a Mahatma, which you, des you describe as a master, mm -hmm. it's all about there's, there's, en there's power is in within you, mm -hmm. the answers yes. are within you. All yes. you have to do is to purify your own mechanisms for understanding and appreciating the universe mm. and you do not need anything other than that other yes. than what you can produce for yourself you don't need someone to tell you what to do as you say in your books there's 1200 pages of wisdom and it all comes back to you and mm. how you interact with yourself for, mm. for implementing those things so mm -hmm. it's really the essence of this is really about individual freedom as a group is mm. that we don't need to we don't need the, you know, to be controlled or instructed by another. Mm. And in fact, if we are being instructed or told what to do, that's usually a sign that they're not yes. um, a master at all. Yes. They feel that they need to control us in order for them to get what they want. Or, mm. um, and so, so in that sense, it's a case of, well, actually, the, all, the, all the, the sages that were murdered uh, over time were ones who preached the, you know, the gospel, as you said, which is, you know, the, it's your about your experience that's key, but you can dramatically enhance your experience through the own work on yourself, which starts with meditation and the study. Lamps to yourselves were the Buddha's last words, or the kingdom of heaven lies within, all the same. And and okay. willing to do the work to uncover the mm. wisdom that's that's hidden for safety reasons. Yeah. But as long as you if you start to look, yes, it will be for revealed to you reasons. because well you just, you just yeah. have to do the work. Yes.
Now, you, you, you say in one of the, an amazing quote from Leibniz that says, every oh, yeah. substance contains mm. all the attributes of God, mm. although in a manner inferior to their divine source. Um, and you also, if I can link them together, because we're within five pages of each other, um, you say things like man is a, is a universe in miniature, mm. which kind of, if you put them together, it's if, if the universe is in everything. Is that right? Yeah, it is saying that all the forces and powers that have gone into making the universe has made you as well. Therefore, those who deny the material existence, or even worse, those who torture the physical body in order to be spiritual, completely deny the source of their own being. Because the physical is as much a manifestation of the divine as as anything else so man is the measure of all things in that sense he, he is indeed a miniature universe because that which, which made the universe made man the hermetic axiom and the hermetic axiom is is absolutely fundamental part of um, the esoteric instruction and what is it and well, in you know the usual saying is as above, so below. But also, also as below, so above. And a very good example in science is Isaac Newton, who observed that the same acceleration due to gravity that caused the fall of the apple, we're told, is the same acceleration due to gravity that causes the the planets and the moon to work in their orbits so he went from the below so to speak and um, formulated a universal principle and mm. that's a wonderful example of the hermetic axiom as above so below yeah and that, and that you as we as human beings are the universe in miniature indeed and Amazing. leibniz uh, is pointing that in its essential purity as that degrades in time so to speak it it loses contact with its source but it never is completely lost from its source mm. so as things externalize and physicalize the more removed you are from the divine center, the divine origin. In a sense, you can think of that as uh, the thermodynamic entropy. And I know in, in this book, you talk about syntropy and entropy, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Um, so because I know entropy, which is the um, thing well, entered. The entropy is... Uh, sort of in the popular terms it's uh, known as the amount of disorder in a system so um, the more the system uh, the more disordered it is the higher its entropy it's the amount of useful energy that can be generated not the total amount of energy the amount of useful energy now syntropy is not the same as negative entropy going uh, entropy the arrow of time only goes in one direction but syntropy is a term that was formulated by luigi fantape and it talks of attractors from well the future you might say that cause increasing complexity and holistic and a, and a holistic approach such that we look at systems as organic beings and not as mechanisms yes so it's really so that the entropy is a disorder yeah is that right so the amount of and because it's, there's a, so measure, much, it's, it's a measure and the disorder stops energy being available for use mm. So if, if I'm thinking about the entropy in my own self, if I'm if I'm on social media one time and then getting all these things and also a lot of um, conflict and that's a good example and hatred and discord, mm. that stops the level of of, of syntropy that's available to me. That mm. if I was to actually integrate and and to also be more harmonious as mm. a as a body, 
the more harmonious I am as a body, the more I'm able to access the energy that's available to me yes. um, around, I guess, in the, you know, we can talk about in the universe, but actually within my environment. Mm. Yes, indeed. Uh, entropy causes, um, has a movement towards divergence and it's unidirectional always. So, and syntropy um, causes an increase in complexity. Complexity does not mean disorder, but through the action of attractors and attractors that emanate from the future and provide systems with their purpose and design. I didn't say this earlier. It, syntropy provides, uh, the, the attractors provide systems with their purpose and de design. So rather than generating disorder via differentiation, syntropy draws individuals and systems together based on their similarities. And the important point here is syntropy strongly suggests teleology, which is purposeful, goal-orientated evolution, which is the absolute bet noir of science. Deterministic science wants to go from cause to effect. It hates any idea of purposeful, goal-orientated design. Mm. As put very beautifully by Terence McKenna, quoted by Rupert Sheldrake in his book, Morphic Resonance, um, give me one free miracle and I'll tell you the rest. Now, the one free miracle, it's a big miracle. It's all the laws of the universe. It's all the wonderful fine-tuned constants. Yeah, give me all of that, and then I will de deterministically tell you all the rest. But you know, the, and the wonderful talking about McKenna is one of his um, colleagues, I guess, really, which was, um, I think, Tim Leary's advice when someone said, yes. if I, you know, as I become more enlightened, what do I do? And the answer was to find the others. And I guess what you're talking about is a power of syntropy is to be an attractor Mm. for other entities to come near you who are like you mm. and so they're also on the same journey on the, on, on the same path or they have mm. the same goals i guess which is right. to you know to have more harmony in the you know in the universe in, mm. you know, for want of a better mm. phrase but actually just to have to have a more fulfilling life right and yes. to be connected with other people who care about things that you care about and who are committed to making you know not positive changes but actually just to be a positive attractor um and to make things better yeah. yes Yes, that's um, very nicely uh, taken forward. I agree, yes. Brilliant. Um, so, Eddie, so I'm just wondering, are there any questions that we need to answer that would give people even more motivation to get into volume one and to... And to... Well, what about the assumptions harden into dogmas? <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and the way science deals with those it wishes to excommunicate well that, that certainly sounds like a wonderful um contrast with the idea of being an attractor rather yeah. than to you know that sounds like something that would that would, well, that would build an, an, entropy. Ex, an executor or excommunicator yeah really? well let's, let's look into that well, well one can summarize uh, them in in four or five broad categories firstly psi phenomena paranormal phenomena across a wide ranging field like physics and botany and biology. That's a, they don't exist. That's rubbish. And it's a classic case of the map dictating the territory. In other words, the concept, mm. the scientific concept dictating what the territory should be. And one can think immediately of uh, Robert John, the great, um, the I think Dean of Princeton, uh, or a dean of the School of Mechanical Engineering at Princeton, who conducted studies going into billions on how our human personal signature can affect the distribution of um, elect a stream of electrons, of fluidic devices, of all sorts of uh, phenomena that could not be accounted for on a purely deterministic basis. Are you talking about an energetic signature? You're not talking about handwritten signature. No, no, no. Sorry, yes, energetic signature. Right. Yeah, yeah, personal. Yeah, exactly so. Yeah. Then, so the map dictates the territory. Um, paranormal doesn't fit into our conceptual map. It's rubbish. 
then there is the reversal of opinions. Whenever new information presents itself, um, firstly, we are so um, quietened by the spectacular nature of the phenomena that we tend to sort of accept it, but then our concepts creep in and we rubbish it. So, for example, um, it was John Taylor, after he witnessed spoon bending by Yuri Geller, so we're told, he first witnessed it and then rejected his own experience on the grounds that he could find no un unknown force to account for it. He could find, but it doesn't mean there wasn't one. And then the other one is discrediting someone's work by smears. So it goes up to the highest level. Sir William Crookes, the, the great scientist the, who Blavatsky mentions many times in the Sacred Doctrine, president of the Royal Society, he was applauded first for his courage in investigating paranormal phenomena and then besmirched by mainstream scientists when he published his positive results. Finally, when a, a scientist does not ask questions until an answer appears, if the answer suits, that's fine. If it doesn't, we ignore him. Mm. So uh, Robert Oppenheimer, powerful man, he said with David Bohm, his student, his mathematics, if we cannot disprove David Bohm, we must ignore him. And then there are the lid sitters, those who ignore or suppress contrary information, and then the hit men of science like James Randi, who was a stage magician and nothing more. So I don't say this in order to sound a sour note, but we have to be aware of how scientists will deal with those who step out of line. And as Ian McGilchrist said, scientists practice now factory fashion. And any young researcher who dares to embark on a different track, especially parapsychology, will find his career very much uh, on the rocks. Mm. But the great scientists, again, the great scientist Einstein in his 1943 talk to the Jewish appeal, Darkest Days of World War, warned us to beware of whom he referred to as the intellectual priests, his words, the intellectuals, the priests. So Einstein's words, the intellect has powerful muscles, but it has no personality. The intellect cannot lead, it can only serve. Mm. So when one is hidebound by intellect, in Ian McGilchrist terms, I suppose, by the left brain, without bringing in the right brain and the holistic approach, one is bound to see problems and run into all sorts of conflict. Mm. Yes. So shall I now share my slides? Yes. Which I hope will round off what has been a very fascinating conversation and i really mean that and I, i'm just going for the notes as well and it's been fantastic and it's like oh my goodness we didn't talk about this we didn't talk about that so let's just leave it at, at just been this you know it's an Maybe extraordinary can, work uh, you produce so so let's just let's bring the slides up and let's have a, a fantastic summary to uh, yeah. to the conversation right let me share this Brilliant. We can see the can slides. See yeah. Excellent. So if I now switch to beginning. Here is a quick summary of what I can only refer as the belief system of scientism, where the scientific approach is the only method and the realism philosophy. Realism means what you can see and touch. 
And this really is a legacy from the Vienna School of Positivism, which says that only empirical evidence is evidence worthy of science. What does empirical mean? It means by experiment, by physical experience. But the weakness in all of this is that it restricts your experience only to physical experience because you can't see the unseen realms. They may exist, but they are meaningless. So we can't talk about it. If I move on in rather more scientific terms, this is a summary of the school of positivism which really exerts a very powerful, if not rather subliminal influence on scientific thinking. Causal closure is very important for science, but causal closure has built into it the met metaphysical position of materialism. Eddie, for those who are, who are listening to this mm -hmm. and not seeing the screen, right. could you just read right. those? Um, okay. I guess axioms or um... yeah, sure. I'm saying physical nature is all that does and can exist, and therefore physical laws and nothing else govern all objects. So properties identified by physics form the fundamental nature of the universe and its inhabitants. And this is very important. Every physical event has a physical cause that brings it about in accordance with the known laws of physics. And that's known as causal closure and constitutes the axis around which the entire philosophical basis of materialism or physicalism evolves. Related to this is this whole issue of thought generated by the brain, which was something that was proposed or dogmatized by Karl Christoph Vogt, the German scientist. And his words were, just as the kidneys produce urine, the liver produces bile, so the brain produces thought. So thoughts stand in the same relation to the brain as urine to the kidneys and bile to the liver. I'll leave those uh, rather ugly words with you. I'm glad they're not mine. So the, the next slide really shows some pictures of Einstein's brain and the received wisdom from neuroscience reported in the Lancet is that um, mathematical and spatial thinking strongly depends on the development of the inferior parietal lobule and a person's thinking capacity is largely explained by physical differences in the brain. Einstein's brain is preserved in two fruit preserving jars pickled in formaldehyde at the University of Pennsylvania. So this strongly says that mathematics depends on your brain, to put it simply. But what a shame now that Professor John Lorber of the University of Sheffield has identified university mathematics students with less than one millimeter of cerebral tissue inside the cranium. He has identified several hundred people with very small cerebral hemispheres. And some people, as he puts it, have no detectable brain, but yet have an IQ of 120. And some are even mathematics graduates. So what happened then to their consciousness? Does this not suggest 
that mind need not be limited just to the brain. Consciousness need not be limited to neurons, and it could be distributed and extended. My next slide really mentions several thorns in the body of mainstream science. The wonderful work of Rupert Sheldrake on morphogenesis and organizing fields to do with the group memory and the habits of nature. Then our old friend, uh, paranormal phenomena, telepathy, mediumship, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, remote viewing, remote dowsing, and occult chemistry are all faculties of consciousness that science struggles to explain in terms of its paradigm of materialism and methodology of reductionism. But please note, we are not castigating scientific materialism in its legitimate context, only when it tries to morph into scientism and explain all of these phenomena in terms of the conceptual map of classical science. And this is, this is what you say about the, about the essence, isn't it, of yes. the value of science, is that, is that it can explain certain things in certain conditions when you get to the you know some of the extraordinary stuff you talk about near-death experience mm -hmm. um, and the consistency of that experience of people mm -hmm. um, or uh, someone like an out-of-body experience is like a, a padre pa or, or a po sorry um is that it's actually it goes so far but not for, not not to include the the universality of of human experience yes so that then requires the deeper teachings that you talk about with the mystery schools and mm -hmm. and the perennial philosophy Indeed. And there's so much evidence now on telepathy that Dean Radin uh, has, uh, has a, a page on his website with, called Show Me the Evidence, and there's thousands of papers mm. on it. Mm. So really to ignore all that <coughs> is thoroughly unscientific. Now, William James, so uh, thought is a function of the brain, but what kind of function? I mentioned functional dependence, steam produced by a kettle, permissive dependence, the crossbow releases the arrow, doesn't produce it, and the third one, transmissive, quoting that beautiful saying from Shelley that life, like a dome of many colored glass, stains the white radiance of eternity. So there is always an analogy between life, intelligence, and light. Let's ask ourselves why some of the most hard-headed physicists are fascinated with the properties of light. They may not know it within themselves, but why are they fascinated with light? Because light is the conduit to the higher realms. Light is a bearer, so to speak, a bearer of intelligence and life. And just as a prism splits white light into its beams, so in uh, terms of Shelley's quotation, our brains act rather like prisms and colored glass, splitting the white radiance of eternity into the various streams of consciousness that we recognize as sorrow, confusion, equilibrium, clarity, happiness. Mm. Now here's the diagram you wanted, uh, Jonathan. The evergreen tree, the perennial tree that Albert Schweitzer referred to. And did not Albert Schweitzer also say three things are necessary for progress? The first is, well, obviously scientific and technological, not to be belittled. The second one is social progress. A third one, the most important, is progress in the spiritual realms. So this evergreen tree 
has produced all kinds of fruit, always the same fruit, but in different shapes and forms. The prehistoric ages, the primordial traditions, and the historic ages. So the beauty is to take all of these branches from the perennial tree and move them upwards and find their source, the roots in heaven. The tree of life, of course, always has its roots in heaven and the branches pointing downwards. And the mystery schools were um, taught in, obviously, um, appropriate places of seclusion, peace and quiet. For example, the um, Elephantar Caves off the coast of Bombay and the amazing Elora Caves. Now, these caves are rock-hewn caves and all of these carvings have no mortar, no cement, no glue, no nothing. They were carved from the top of the mountain downwards. And that's absolutely incredible. And the Elora Caves uh, were Buddhist, Jain, Hindu, and Sikh. The Ajanta Caves were Buddhist. And so this is, uh, if someone's listening, then either you can look at the presentation or you can Google um, Elephanta Caves, um, right. Bombay, mm -hmm. and Elora, which is E-L-L-O-R-A Caves, mm -hmm. um, which again, it's just, it's just the most extraordinary thing, isn't it? And, it? and the other thing as well is you look at this, this idea that, that we're the pinnacle of, of insight and wisdom, mm -hmm. um, and then you look at something as magnificent as this with no mistakes and, um, and literally cut out of rock. So there is no space for mistakes in it. Yes, exactly. Um, and it's, it's absolutely breathtaking. And it's of the deepest import, Jonathan, that when Pythagoras journeyed through uh, ancient Persia and Hindustan, he was uh, a pupil of the ancient Brahmins at Elephanta and Elora. And the name of Pythagoras is still preserved in the Brahmin records. He is referred to as Yavanacharya, Yavanacharya, Charya truth, the Ionian teacher. And uh, Dr. Radhakrishna, Sir Sarvapali Radhakrishna, president of India, formerly professor of philosophy at Oxford, has written very eloquently how the wisdom from the East has seeded Western thought and science. And I find it very moving how this tremendous wisdom has been carried by these incredible sages, Pythagoras for one, of course, taken to the West and then seeded and fertilized the greatest minds in the West. For example, Isaac Newton, who revered Pythagoras, of course, and Plato. But what did Newton say coming back to meditation? Plato is my friend. Aristotle is my friend, obviously, Pythagoras as well. But my best friend is truth. Hmm. So the mystery teachings about who or what am I, the purpose of the mystery is always to unfold our inner nature. So the mysteries of antiquity deal with the Greeks and early Christians, the Egyptians, Persian, Indians, and the American mysteries of North, Central, and South America. The contemporary mystery teachings, really the Theosophical movement, and related 19th century spiritual teachings of uh, Emerson, uh, Ralph Waldo Trine, Walter Russell Bowman, transcendentalism, which all 
again emphasize the primacy of thought. But the consummate achievement of the mysteries is always man united with himself, with his higher self. And the real alchemy, the only alchemy of which turning lead into gold is only an allegory, the real alchemy is that spiritual illumination is attained only by raising the lower nature towards the highest grade of perfected functioning and purity. And it is this knowledge of how man's composite nature can be most speedily unfolded to the point of illumination. It is this knowledge that constitutes the secret or esoteric doctrine of all ages and the objective of the mystery teachings. Really, really that was a fantastic summary of the conversation. I, I, honest to goodness, now I'm wondering how on earth I'm going to edit this. Um, but I just think as a way of showing people the, a, a sample of the riches in your work, mm. four volume um, masterpiece that is your, your book. Um, yeah, so just thank you very much for your time today, Eddie. It's, um, it's been absolutely wonderful. So we're going to talk again um, in a few weeks time when you give me some time to read book number two. Yes. Um, so I encourage the readers to, to get a hold of a copy of the book, which is available at Shepherd Walwyn or um, hopefully all good bookshops as well. Um, and I think it's, it's the most expensive book I've ever had, um, but also the most useful, I think, really, just given the, the depths and breadths of it. So um, I'd encourage people to make the investment. But if you if you still want more persuasion, then do tune in for, for further conversations that we'll be having in the in the coming weeks. Um, but Eddie, Jonathan, it only costs 10 pence a page. <laughs> <laughs> and each volume is less than the price of an expensive paperback. You're talking of four volumes at 98. Yes. So yes, how much do true. we spend going to London for a meal out? It is, you know what, and that, that would, yes. That's over the next day. This will stay with you, I hope. <laughs> it is. It's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful codification and a, and a wonderful, you know, if people are interested in in the, the, the life that you talk about, really, which is the, mm. the enhancement of your own experience of, of life, then mm. um, this is just a wonderful, it's a wonderful starting point. Um, Thank you so much, Jonathan, for the invitation. I'm very honoured and I really mean that sincerely. Thank you for watching this video. To explore these ideas further, be sure to visit shepherdwalwin.com and join our mailing list for news and special offers. Check out our authors and buy the books to learn more. And you can also find us on social media. Links are in the description box. So please like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's surprisingly helpful in getting our ideas out. So until next time, keep reading.